The EFF leader is known for his outspokenness on matters relating to race, land and others. But is Malema creating unnecessary racial tensions and do such statements inflame race relations in the country? Or is there something underlying that the rest of the country perhaps does not see? These are some of the questions that we'll be answering tonight. I'm Kathy Mutatlana and this is our nightly look at South Africa under the Ramaphosa administration. You're watching as it happens. Well, my guest on As It Happens Tonight is EFF leader Julius Malema. Julius, thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you for having me. When you look at that video, the clip of the interview that you did with TRT, with the benefit of hindsight and seeing the kind of responses that there have been to it, what do you make of it? I'm very proud. I'm proud that I'm not a coward like many of you who want to tell the truth and are scared. It is what it is. It has to be confronted like that. Um, if I had not spoken, many other things in this country will not be happening. It was a taboo to speak about the land. It was a taboo to speak about economic transformation. No one would have imagined marching to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. They were untouchable like that. And I've taken a conscious decision individually and collectively with the leadership of the EFF to deal with unspoken matters which people are concerned about. You see, the, the, the uh, civil war which will happen in this country it will not be as a result of Malema saying one or two things. It will be out of the frustration our people are confronted with. There is a serious problem of underdevelopment. There is a serious problem of not sharing the resources of this country. And the whites becoming more richer and the blacks becoming more poor. We ought to confront it. We ought to be honest about it. We must not be scared. And generations after us will thank us. Uh, we'll get to your comments on the impending unleashed as you see it in the country. But perhaps let's begin with just the way in which how the statement within the interview was phrased, especially when it comes to the future of white people in the country and whether or not they should consider themselves safe in the country, it seems to leave the window open, creating room for general fear about what the future of white people in this country is. The white people in South Africa are the most safe people. There's no one in South Africa who's more safe than white people. They are untouchable. They receive immediate attention when they complain. Actually, if a white person dies in the farm or dies anywhere in the suburbs, it becomes news. And we forget that thousands and thousands of black people die every day in this country, do not receive the similar attention white people receive. Why? Because of privilege, because they enjoy the maximum protection this country can offer. So there's no white person who's threatened. They know, they know it is a discourse. They know it is robust at times. It can be scary at times. That's what democracy is about. It's about engaging on uncomfortable issues, but knowing very well that those who are in charge of such engagements do not possess even a potential of engaging um, in, a, in, a, in a genocide. I, I say in the similar interview that under my leadership, I don't see the EFF engaged in any form of racial or white genocide. It will never happen. So are you therefore intentional in terms of how you choose to frame things in, in a way that seeks to break the status quo of comfort as you see it where white people are concerned? I, I enjoy creating an uncomfortable situation for those who are comfortable uh, and making uh, comfortable for those who are not comfortable. That's the way we can disrupt the status quo. I'm not the type to comply with the status so quo. So are you saying that it's simply semantics on your part? No, it's a commitment. If it was semantics, it would have disappeared long time ago. You can go into the archives of the ET before ENCA existed. I said all of this when I was very young. I'm committed to it. Many people tried to persuade me of these things. Many have punished me for the views I hold. I've never changed. I've lost a lot of things, both personally and politically, for use. And I will never change them because I don't agree for anyone to bully me uh, for thinking. No one can take away my thinking capacity. You may not enjoy it. You may be uncomfortable. But, you know, the recent history teaches me that at the beginning, they disagree with me. 
And as it goes on, majority of them begin to say the same things that we have been saying. For those who see it as a call then to, I suppose, more generally create um, Racial, racial tension within the country and even as some form of um, subtext or subliminal message around white people and how they should be treated, how do you engage it on that level? Because if I hear you correctly, you're saying that it's part of your political discourse. But for those who see it even as a call to then uh, act out, what you're saying in that discourse? Would have wiped them out if there was a, a call to such an action. There's no such a call to, to the action. I'm saying to you, depending on how you conduct yourself moving forward, you might attract serious onslaught on yourselves. You have to come to the party, and the sooner you do that, the better before we engage the unled revolution, which will be anarchy. And this will be necessitated by the fact that you are in possession of 90% of the resources of South Africa, whereas you are constituting less than 10% of the population of South Africa. This on its own is a recipe for disaster. It's not Malema's creation. They've uh, created it during apartheid. They're still protecting it till to date. The sooner they change that, the better, so that you don't create environment conducive for racial wars, or rather even a, you know, a civil war um, uh, in South Africa. It but can only be stopped by sharing the resources of this country. And certainly when you speak about this unled revolution, a part of it seems to be equated to the inequality levels that exist in, in the country. Inequality is not something that's unique to South Africa. And in societies the world over where there is inequality, it doesn't automatically result in revolution. So what then makes you think that South Africa within itself is ripe for such an unled revolution to take South place? South Africa is already in a crisis. Me and you will know that our people are revolting every day in the townships. Our people are burning buildings. Our people are, are taking... Um, state institutions for lack of service delivery, poverty and inequality in South Africa. It is happening and it's happening in some pockets of the country. If not properly addressed, it will come together at some point and it will be a disaster for our country. We are a unique nation. We cannot be compared to anyone. We know our rights. We are not existing in a totalitarian society where we will be scared to speak truth to power and take that which is being said by white supremacists as truth and uh, as something that cannot be challenged. But we are known for challenging uh, uh, those type of things. But when we speak about revolution, we're also speaking about, you know, fundamentally changing whether it, the economy, the political structure and the society um, or state as it were. And so to the, to the extent that it would need the majority of South Africans, do you feel that that's where the majority of South Africans are? Well, 1976 was not the majority of South Africans, but it was a turning point. And, and we will have that time repeating itself at some point based on inequalities. I agree, a revolution is a complete overhaul. And for as long as things continue the way they are, people occupying the land permanently in conflict with law enforcement, people fighting amongst themselves uh, because they are fighting for scarce resources, once it comes together, it will catch fire, and those uh, questions of why is it not happening in other countries will be irrelevant. Because it's not happening in other countries, it doesn't mean it can't happen here. Yes, so but, let's but, resolve but, but, but it before it happens because we've got experience of it happening in 1976. We've got experience of it happening from 1985 nonstop until the apartheid regime succumbed to internal and international pressure. Uh, so we, it's not for the first time that our people will revolt. Do They've you, done so before. But, so what I'm really pointing to is the support of the masses in such uh, an, an uprising, at least as, as a revolution rather as you see it. The masses are on board. The masses are themselves complaining, but they are hoping that uh, the solution will come with the leadership, uh, particularly from different political formations. They see us engaging. They see us pushing. All these types of things that we're doing we are actually giving them hope. And once they realize that even after all of this has happened, still there's nothing that has changed materially, they will tell themselves. They will say the leadership has failed. We still have got 
organizations like the EFF, which are inspiring hope, and the people are saying, perhaps let's give it time, uh, and uh, these new formations uh, will deliver that which those who came before them failed to deliver. Very briefly, before we go to a sure. uh, break, do you think there should be a revolution in South Africa? Absolutely. There should be a revolution. There should be a led revolution, which is orderly, but is radical, and it changes the status quo. What does South Africa look like post-revolution? What kind of system would be in place post-revolution? Well, post-revolution, the state will own the strategic means of production. The economy will be in the hands of the people as invested by the Freedom Charter. The land shall be in the hands of our people. And there will be equal society. In that equal society, there shall be peace and harmony. All right, we're going to continue our conversation with uh, Julius Malema on As It Happens. Thanks for staying with As It Happens. My guest tonight is EFF leader uh, Julius Malema, and we continue our conversation. Before we went to the break, uh, Julius, we were speaking about, you know, revolution and how you see it as the, the answer, basically, to the country's current problems. Is it a convenient message for you to warn about an impending unled revolution, given that ultimately it plays into what you would want to see achieved in this country by your own um, statement made before the break? Well, uh, we, we, we are for the revolution. We are in the revolution and uh, we are conscientizing society. This is what we want to achieve and we don't hide it. We, we're not conducting a secret society. We're a legitimate political formation that seeks to bring about radical change. And radical change on its own is a revolution. It can be done in an orderly manner. It can be done in a manner that it is not disastrous to the economy of our republic. Which, which examples would you be looking at for that? Well, we don't have to necessarily get examples. We have to have a conviction. But we've got a situation where the people, for instance, in uh, Zimbabwe, have got their own land and uh, they are successfully uh, working the land without being under the supervision of those who used to own the land before. We've got a situation in China where the strategic means of production, including the land, is owned uh, by the state. And therefore, there is no really a disaster uh, for the Chinese uh, uh, economy. The most countries that threatens to leave South Africa if we do certain things are actually operating in China itself. Well, what about democracy and civil liberties? In the, because there's a different conversation to be made about the economy. I don't think that um, you and I would necessarily agree, especially in Zimbabwe. But what about democracy? But what is our point of disagreement, for instance, in Zimbabwe? You cannot want to measure the success of the Zimbabwean revolution based on the capitalist definition of success. Uh, the Zimbabweans themselves, I'm saying to you, production has doubled, they are working their land. We need to respect, of course, the civil rights of our people. We must respect the individual rights of our people. People must exercise their democratic rights without any form of terror or intimidation. Is that, coming is, from is the that state. secondary for you? It's primary. For anything to prevail, individuals must exercise uh, their rights. Um, that's what I'm saying to you. In the narrative that we are advocating for, no one speaks about pulling away the civil rights of any other individual. All we're saying is that let's share in the resources of our country. But the Constitution, which guarantees individuals' rights, should be protected, and those rights should be protected as well. So as you see it, Zimbabwe is still um, a model after which... Okay, no, we're talking about Zimbabwe in the context of uh, uh, land ownership and ownership of strategic means of production in that country. Of course, when it comes to the rights, there were some form of violations. I spoke about or against them, rather. When I was in Zimbabwe, I shocked one of the rallies of ZANU-PF where I said that cutting people's hands, beating up people, torturing people is not the future. We ought to exist in a democratic manner and win people through the power of persuasion, not through terror. There's no question about the fact that all political parties are thinking about 2019, the elections coming up. What's your strategy going into the election? Well, our strategy is that we have to speak to our people. We have to make sure that each How and every house to them? must be visited 
every registered voter must be known uh, to the EFF and they must be spoken to. We've got an approach in the EFF that says even people who are well-known supporters of different political formations, we must speak to them because most political parties in South Africa are in conflict with themselves. Their own members and supporters are not happy. You don't know what you'll get from talking to those uh, uh, people. So our strategy is that motu motu, you must never let a person pass. That the die to than let the enemy pass. So that's what Mugaba taught us. We must always uh, ensure that we speak to our people. People can't vote for something they don't know. They have to know that there is an alternative called the EFF. That's how the ANC kept on defeating other political parties. Sure. It didn't exist. The parties did not exist in the rural areas, in the areas where the ANC was dominant, because they had given up that those are ANC's territories. We are entering every territory. Some analysts are saying that just as the DA, now that um, Jacob Zuma is out of office, the EFF is um, running out of ideas in terms of staying relevant and uppermost on people's minds. And uh, to quote Ralph Matera, that you're recalibrating your radicalism in order to keep the attention of potential. Well, voters. I don't take him serious. I don't take any analyst in South Africa serious. They've never organized anything in their lives. Some of them have never organized a mere 21st birthday party for themselves or their children. So they don't know nothing about But organization has nothing to do with engaging people on an intellectual level, and they're saying that part of how they're you think reading... You are going to win elections through engagement in intellectual level. We're talking about elections. Stick to the topic. You asked me about elections. Yes. I'm answering the elections. And elections have got nothing to do with engagement in a, at the level of intellectual engagement. We can do that with Ralph Mateja and render him useless. He, I mean, he's got no superior logic. I'm saying to you, Mm -hmm. When it comes to elections, analysts' ideas are useless because they've got no idea what they are talking about. Remember that the mobilization and, and electoral politics, the majority of the strategies are not even documented. And therefore, Ma Mateja is bookish like that. Majority of them are bookish like that. They've got no practical example and experience of what it means uh, to organize the ground. How does the EFF become irrelevant? Because the EFF is in the lips of everybody since Ramaphosa came in. Ramaphosa is not uh, to the EFF. He's the most irrelevant person. Actually, he, Zuma is destabilizing him to the latter. I think uh, uh, his biggest problem is, is Zuma. So we are smooth sailing because Zuma is doing the work for us. So why should we be worried about Ramaphosa? Ramaphosa is over-exaggerated. I like Ramaphosa because he wants to remain Mr. Clean. And the only way Mr. Clean is becoming uh, undecisive. You don't take any decision. You just stay out of decisions. And in the absence of not taking any decision, we come in and provide leadership. Look at that parliament. We've been leading in terms of ideas. The Ramaphosa, the over-celebrated Ramaphosa, has been tailing behind uh, the EFF, the land issue. We are now on Reserve Bank. There are so many issues we have tabled in Parliament with your Ramaphosa coming after us. So Ramaphosa is no threat to the EFF at all. Do you see the EFF or your party as an organization that promotes identity politics or that f uh, finds a huge part of how it functions around identity politics? Identity politics are not created by the EFF. We found them here. Uh, people are identified according to their race, according to uh, their relationship to the means of production. You're either white class or you're bourgeois. You're either black or and if you're black, you're either African or you're white. So we found them here. All we're saying is that South Africa has been divided along those lines. And with Africans being the most oppressed people. And our priority, at least for now, is on the liberation of Africans in uh, so that they become equal partners in this country. So as it stands, is the EFF a party for African people? No, it's for everyone. Liberation of everyone oppressed in South Africa, blacks in general and Africans in particular. That has always been uh, our forecap uh, because in the movement where we come from and in the traditions uh, where we come from, the priority has always been the Africans, who are the what? most oppressed. Sure. And in the Africans, it's women.
because women suffered triple oppression one because they are women two because they're african three because they are a working class and when you put emphasis on women it doesn't mean you sexist you are just considering the historical facts which have to be taken into consideration but, but what about those who feel that revolution. what about those who feel that sometimes the approach alienates people of other races no no it doesn't alienate them for for instance let's take the a recent issue of Floyd where he says Momo undermines uh, 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 Africans in the, in the uh, Department of uh, uh, Treasury. He's putting emphasis on the fact that there's from time to time a temptation from our Indian brothers and sisters to want to think they're superior to Africans. It is not of their own creation. Apartheid instilled that uh, mentality and we have to confront it and do away uh, with it. We're not alienating anyone. We're just speaking truth and that truth has to be uh, confronted as it is. But the fact that it's received as um, a, a means of exclusion, does, does that not No, change? it's not received like that. Our people understand it very well. You, you want to tell me about uh, the rented mob which want to destroy exactly what uh, uh, we stand for and what Floyd said. I, I really don't care about the Who feelings the of those Who is the rented mob? No, I've seen, I've seen a, a rented mob here attacking Floyd on the things that he didn't say. Uh, and we all knew what uh, you know uh, uh, Floyd had actually said. So, and actually Floyd said it much, much more politely. I would have been worse than Floyd if I was there. All right. Um, do you, in terms of the 2019 elections, how well are you expecting that the EFF will do? EFF will do very well. I think EFF will uh, emerge victorious. We are now busy with launching our uh, regions. Uh, we have experienced some few problems in some few regions. We're dealing with them. And uh, I'm happy that uh, before we even launch our manifesto, we'll be having structures in all corners of South Africa, which is a guarantee that EFF will actually uh, perform much better. Percentage numbers? Well, uh, I don't want to uh, predict the unpredictable because democracy has got no guarantees. Uh, it can give birth to a monster. So we, we, we actually hope for the best to get more than 50 percent and govern south africa and govern it much better if we don't take south africa we hope to take certain provinces and give practical example of what the eff government will offer to the entire country all right thanks for coming on to Thank as you. it happens tonight the leader of the eff julius malema it brings us to an end of tonight's edition of as it happens i'm kathy <coughs>